Guten Tag, welcome. This is Master Instructor Chairman General Ayatollah Thorson, the Benevolent Dictator, coming to you live from Bunker 167. Today we're going to be talking about Jacksonian America, also known as McFluffy's America. So let's get started. First section we're going to look at today is the rise of mass politics. What was the electorate like? The electorate is the group of people that vote. At first, in the beginning of our country, it was just white males who owned property, but now it's starting to extend to suffrage for all white males. And the West was starting to do that, Western states, but it was making the East nervous that people would want to flee the East to go to these places, so they started doing it too. Um, some places didn't want to change. We saw in Massachusetts that conservatives wanted to re still require the property requirements, but eventually they just said as long as you pay taxes that you can vote if you're white male. Um, we saw some issues in Rhode Island as well. The conservative government didn't want to make changes, so Thomas Dore and his People Party just created their own government. There were two simultaneous governments at the same time in 1842, but eventually the Dorr Rebellion and the Dorrites who followed him with the People's Party ultimately failed. The South, how did they have elections? They, they, they basically um, allowed for all white male suffrage, but all the laws they created basically were made to help planters and, and politicians from the older counties, so it really pushed the elite up. Uh, nowhere women could vote. Nowhere were there secret ballots, meaning like you'd go in a booth, you'd basically like have to tell the person there who you're voting for, and that could be causing problems because you could almost get bullied into changing your vote. Now electors for the Electoral College are now being chosen for the most part in almost every state by people, not by legislature, so people actually get a say in who votes for president. With the expansion of the electorate, we're also seeing the increase in political participation. More people can vote, they're going to. So we're also starting to see the legitimization of the party. We're starting to see that come back into full force. It starts as the grassroots movement at, in New York by Martin Van Buren. He creates the Bucktails to go against the governor, DeWitt Clinton, who was just felt, they felt was tyrannical. And, and the, re, the, the, the basic um, rationale behind having that is they said that having two political parties allows for a check and balance on the other so that politicians are forced to represent the people's will and there's not one group just completely taking over and doing whatever they want that might be against what the people want. So by the late 1820s, uh, especially because of Andrew Jackson's election in 1828, we're seeing that the idea of political parties go to the national le level. We've got the Democrats, he dropped the ah off of the end of Democratic Republicans, and he is now the Democratic Party, and then the anti-Jacksons, the Whigs, you know, the We Hate Jackson Greatly Party. McFluffy was known as the president of the common man because his democracy, Jacksonian democracy, is basically known as leaving to the common man, making all men, white men in this case, equal. So his, his party didn't really embrace any type of ideological position, but they were committed to, to having equality for all men, and the way they did that was to kind of put down the Eastern aristocracy and promoting more of the aristocracy and the men in the West and in the New South. Um, but basically the main job was to promote the white male democracy and to subjugate the African Americans and the Indians because, as we know, he was racist. Um, first thing he did when he got into office, he got rid of about a fifth of the federal office holders over his tenure of office, but that was his first main goal is to get rid of people he felt were corrupt and shouldn't be in office, but then he replaced it with the spoil system where he put his own friends into office. That's what the spoil system is all about. Friends and supporters are getting those, um, getting appointed by the ones who get elected. Uh, the, the supporters worked also to transform the presidential nomination system. In 1832, rather than having the elite run the show, they kind of got rid of the elite and had the common man run the show. So because of the spoil system, because of the convention, we're starting to see that the entrenched elites, the ones who felt like they could just dig in and they were there just forever, they're starting to go by the wayside and more of the power is uh, truly getting transferred to the people. Next section we're going to look at is what's known as our federal union, which is basically the idea of do we support sectionalism or nationalism. Well, Calhoun was the one that was really the leader of sectionalism, and he actually promoted the idea of nullification. Here's the situation. In the late 1820s, the tariff of abominations that was put against um, European countries, making the prices higher in the United States, 
really hurt the southern states, according to them. In reality, they were really getting hurt because there was more farmland in the west, and they were kind of taking away some of their business, but we're just not going to talk about that. We don't want to have to actually blame the real thing. We're just going to blame things that sound better. So he didn't like it. He felt that South Carolina felt they had the right to nullify it. And so Vice President Calhoun at the time said the Virginia, the Kentucky resolutions, they were all for nullification. And listen, we, the states, were the ones that ratified the Constitution. So we, the states, are the ones that have the final decision on constitutionality of law. Not Congress, not the Supreme Court, us, the states. So therefore, we should be able to hold a convention to nullify any law that we feel is unjust at the federal level. We're also seeing the rise of Martin Van Buren at the time. He's making his way up to the top. He was actually Secretary of State in 1829, appointed by McCluskey. And um, he was also not only that, but a member of his kitchen cabinet, which was like his unofficial inner circle of advisors. Also, what really put him to the top in, in McFluffy's eyes was his support of Peggy Eaton and that whole affair with the scandal where she was a mistress, became a wife of one of the cabinet members, and Calhoun's wife just shunned her and said it was wrong. But, you know, Jackson was a little um, empathetic of that because his wife died from being um, what he felt was being scrutinized. So in 1831, when Jackson was deciding who he should put his support and, and back when he became, um, when he left office, he put it behind Van Buren and not John C. Calhoun. Another thing that caused a major strain between the relationship between McFluckley and Dr. Emmett Brown, also known as John C. Calhoun, was the Webster-Hain debate. You're like, wait a minute, how would that debate cause them to not like each other? They're not, their names aren't Daniel Webster, Robert Hain, well, here's what happened. The Hain Webster debate was basically over nationalism versus state rights. And the idea was that they were going to stop, Congress was going to stop for a little bit, the sale of Western lands. They just thought it was going too quickly. And Robert Hain, senator, said, hey, wait a minute. This is the East's chance to have tyranny over the West and the South because if they take, if they spread the lands to the West, that means that there's less power for the Eastern. Uh, aristocrats and therefore they want this tyranny and they want to rule over us. Let the let them expand. And the nationalist Senator Daniel Webster from Massachusetts like, no, no, we don't, how dare you say that we want that? How dare you challenge the integrity of the Union? We're trying to spread out for the good of the country, not so the East can rule and the Northeast can rule. So not only did he go against Hain when he said that, but Calhoun was also a supporter of what Hain's belief was. Well, Jackson announced at the Democratic Party, he had to figure out which side to take, and here's his stance. He doesn't really take a side, but you pretty much get the gist of it when he says, our federal union, it must be preserved. So when he says that, he's pretty much backing without saying it, but they got the idea of Webster, and it just makes the rift between Calhoun and McCluffy even further. So now we're seeing a nullification crisis, which we're starting to see sectionalism on the rise. Here's what happened. 1832, Congress looked at the tariff of abominations, but really did nothing to relieve South Carolina of the troubles that they were going through with it. So South Carolina held that state com uh, convention to nullify it. And in um, support of it, Calhoun resigned as vice president, and then Senator Hayne resigned and became the governor of South Carolina. Well, Jackson said, if they nullify it, it's treason. What you are doing is treason. You are going against the United States government. That's wrong. And we know what happens to people who are trusting us. Well, what he did was he strengthened in retaliation, strengthened the federal courts in South Carolina to make sure that if they tried to do anything, that we would have military action in that area. Um, and they, he authorized the use of military action to make sure that whatever Congress did was obeyed in that state. Well, no states supported South Carolina. South Carolina's like, come on, everybody. And everybody's kind of like looking away like, ooh, that's, that's a bad idea. And they're like, oh, crap, what do we do now? So Henry Clay offered a compromise to the tariff. He's like, listen, I know it's not great. How about if we try to lower the rates so they're not as high as they are today? So the South Carolina State Convention said, okay, we'll repeal the nullification on the tariff. We think that's wrong. But this whole force act that Jackson's got going on, McFluffy is going down. We are not following this, and we refuse to acknowledge it. So that was just their way of being able to show that they felt like they could nullify anything that was done by the national government. All right, here's that time in history when McFluffy makes a decision that kind of makes us 
turn our head just a little bit. It's kind of embarrassing. We really don't want to admit to one of these things. But guess what? We didn't do it at least. Um, but this is really pretty bad. Uh, in the 18th century, we're seeing that the Indians were known as noble savages, as Thomas Jefferson called them, that basically said, listen, they're savages, but if they learn to be white, they can be normal. Great, that's awesome. But in the 19th century, people are just more upset with them because they had to worry about them and the land, and they're like, nope, just savages, we don't even want them here. And the people moving out west were like, listen, I don't really want them here because if they just listen i'm going to take their land anyway so they're probably not going to be really happy about it so i don't i don't want to have to like fight them for it can we just like send them somewhere else and they realized the only person who could really take take, take care of that the only level that could take care of that was the federal government they were the only ones that could really have the power to deal with the indians after that all the supreme court decisions were made so they were trying to create these new large entities to deal with the whites because the Indians are like, this is not good. We know bad things are about to happen. The final step to get rid of the um, old Indians in the old Northwest, which we call the Midwest today, was the Black Hawk War. It happened from 1831 to 1832, and it was to move, remove the Indians in the place. Well, it was, the reason it was uh, notable, a couple of reasons. Number one, Abraham Lincoln kind of fought in it. He didn't fight, but he was part of it. And it was notable, more importantly, for its violence uh, by the military. Unfortunately, the, the um, Chief Black Hawk was trying to surrender, and they were fleeing, and still the military went after them and brutally murdered the uh, Indians as well as women and children, similar to what we learned about in Vietnam with My Lai. Again, this is the time and period where we're looking at Jackson's actions, and it's kind of a little bit embarrassing. It has to do with the five civilized tribes. These are the tribes that were located in Georgia in the south. They had actually established an agricultural society. They were very peaceful. Um, they were even um, under the expansion of the Constitution in 1827, uh, known as the Cherokee Nation. Well, the federal government was actually working at the time to try to remove these tribes, move them west. It was going pretty slow, um, but then by 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act to finance negotiations with tribes to buy their land and relocate them out west. Um, state governments were pressuring this as well. But the, the five civilized tribes, as they were known, of the Cherokee Nation, they actually went to Georgia court and said, we don't want to go, we're good, we, we don't have any problems. And um, it seemed okay, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia case and the Worcester um, versus Georgia case as well the, the next year seemed to protect the Indians. But as we know, Jackson stepped in and was like, no, I want them out, I want them out west. He sent troops in to remove them under General Winfield Scott, which we'll learn more about him in the future. He's a pretty important figure. So the uh, five civilized tribes were forced to go on what was dubbed the Trail of Tears. It was just a trek that towards the Indian Territory, which we now know as Oklahoma. It began in the winter of 1838. Thousands died before they actually reached the place because of the brutal winter. Um, the Cherokees weren't alone, though. Between 1830 and 1838, um, not only were they expelled from that place, but... Um, Congress created the uh, Indian Act, Intercourse Act of 1834, which basically gave them more lands because uh, the white people in the West were getting undesirable lands. So they're like, I like where the Indians are. Give us those lands. So they got moved again. Um, the only ones that really resisted and were able to stay um, east of the Mississippi were the Seminole tribe in Florida. Yes, they were removed from there and moved to... Indian Territory, but there was still a minority group under uh, Chief Osceola that stayed and fought. Now, Jackson sent his um, the military down to fight them, but because of the use of guerrilla warfare, they were able to hold their own and stay in Florida. Here's what the removal of the Indians meant for the United States. Well, by the end of the 1830s, most of the Indians had been pushed west of the Mississippi into lands that were inhabitable and that were surrounded by forts, so it's not like they were really allowed to go anywhere. So that's great. It's a great way to treat people. Uh, the white movement west really couldn't be stopped, so they're like, well, I guess we could, like, cohabitate with them like they did in the northwest of Texas, but who would ever want to think of an actually good moral idea like that? I don't know. Uh, by the mid-19th century, though, Americans believed that western lands were, there's no pre-existing civilizations there. They just assumed that it was free to go. Well, they didn't realize there were more Indians in this area. 
And um, they were like, well, I guess we're going to have to face up and figure out what to do with them. But they refused to see them as equal partners because they were not as intelligent. They didn't have the industry or the morals that white people did. It's like, oh, great. We're getting even more racist now. Perfect. Another war that Jackson was waging at the time was the bank war. He was fighting against Nicholas Biddle to get rid of the Bank of the United States. He hated it. He thought it was terrible, which was kind of strange because here's how it was set up. By 1830, there were the, the headquarters were in Philadelphia. They had 19 branches in, in 19 different cities, and um, there was only one place to, to deposit government um, money. So it was kind of a little bit inconvenient, but Nicholas Biddle actually made it sound and prosper. He was the president of the Bank of the United States, and he wanted the charter to extend. Well, Jackson wanted to destroy it. McFluffy said, this bank is going down. There was actually two groups, though, that didn't really like it. There were the soft money advocates who said that they felt that the bank should allow for states to issue their own currencies rather than having to deal with theirs. But then there were also the hard money advocates like McFluffy who said that gold and silver should be back in currency to make it more valuable. And they were suspicious of the expansion and speculation that the bank was allowing for. They felt like too much of it and things were going to collapse and blow up in their face. Like we've seen with the 2008 housing crisis bubble. You give out too much money and then all of a sudden it, it collapses and breaks because it's just money was oozy and falling all over the place. So that's kind of the same idea. Well, Jackson didn't renew the, uh, didn't want the renewal of it in 1836. Biddle tried to save the bank. He was trying to get uh, some people with political clout on his side by giving them financial favors like Daniel Webster and Henry Clay. He was trying to get them on their side, and he did. But um, the renewal, the, the recommended renewal for the bill got moved up to 1832. Congress passed it, Jackson vetoed it, and it could not be overridden. And somehow, even though uh, Clay ran against Jackson in 1832 for the Whigs, um, Jackson, with Van Buren as his vice president, were still able to win the election, even despite the fact that many people did feel that the Bank of the United States was a good thing. Jackson was determined to kill this monster that he called the Bank of the United States. So what did... We, what did he do? Well, McFluffy decided to pretty much take all the government's funds out of there, and he had a secretary of treasury that refused to do it, fired him. The second one refused to do it, fired him too. So Roger Taney got into office, and he actually said it was okay. So Jackson put the money into what were called the pet banks. He took all the money, government's money, out of the Bank of the United States and threw it into these pet banks. Well, it hurts the Bank of the United States because that's what they would use to loan out money to other people. So this is really bad. And financial conditions were getting worse and worse. By 1833 and 1834, the two sides were blaming each other. They should have kept the money in. No, you are just wrong in the first place. So finally, Bill tried to contract credit too far. Like he gave too much money to the business community. And, and, and by doing that, it, it caused major financial problems. And he was forced to grant credit in abundance on reasonable terms. And those tactics that he was trying to do, like, I just give a lot of credit and, and they'll pay me back and they'll make us prosper, it blew up in his face because times were kind of tough at the time. So it ended the chance of any type of rechartering. And by 1836, we're starting to see a major change in the banking system because it's unstable. There's not one uniform way of doing things. This is the change that we're starting to see in American politics. This is the first time we're really seeing the modern democracy come to a head when it comes to um, political parties. Now, the Democrats versus the Whigs, there is a major difference between the two. The Democrats envisioned, um, they went to expand economic and political opportunities for all white males, rich, poor, whatever, but they wanted a limited government because if they um, felt like if they removed that obstacle and attacked corruption, they could defend the union better and it would be better for the country. But we're also seeing the Whigs on the opposite side. They're like, no, we want to expand the federal government and allow for industrial and commercial development, um, basically by especially those who are, who are more wealthy. Um, and they felt like if they did that, that, that that's when um, Henry Clay came up with the American system of combining the country and working together. But they were really afraid of westward expansion for the simple fact that they felt like that would cause instability. And they were right. We know that that's the main thing that causes civil war. 
Um, who supported who? Well, the Whigs had major support from those in the East manufacturers and merchants in the East, wealthy Southern planters and um, Western commercialists. But the Democrats had more uh, support from smaller merchants, um, New England workmen, Southern planters that um, were a little afraid of industry, but they basically had the common man on their side, um, especially those in the South and the West and agrarian Westerners. Uh, but what was their number one priority? To win elections. Um, the Whigs tried to make the Democrats look undemocratic while the um, Democrats were trying to get any type of um, support they could get on their side as well. Um, the Whigs had a great group, but it was also what caused them to fail. They had what they called the Great, the great Triumvirate, which was uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John C. Calhoun, huge names at the time. But they, the Whigs couldn't pick anybody, so it was like Van Buren versus three Whigs. It was terrible logic because, as we know, a house divided cannot stand, and that easily won Van Buren the election because it was him on one side against three on the other, and those three split the vote, therefore he won the election in 1836. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start talking about the Panic of 1837. Remember, Martin Van Buren won in 1836, but he took office in 1837. Things were great, canals were being built, railroads being built, credit's easy, business is booming, and then not so good. Remember, as I taught you in class, 1835 to 1837 was the only time in history we actually had a surplus in our American history. So they created the Distribution Act that said, here are states, take a little bit of this, take a little bit of that, and build with it. Well, it made a panic. So this, we're also seeing this, the withdrawal from these pet banks where all the federal money was caused a little bit of a panic. They were calling for loans. So Jackson said, okay, 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 I got this. Here's what we're going to do. He created the specie circular that said that if you're to buy public land, instead of making sure that they have to get loans, you just have to use hard money with it, the gold or the silver to buy it. And money that was backed by gold and silver. Well, not many places had money backed by gold and silver. So it caused a major problem. It caused a panic. And then all of a sudden we see these banks failing, businesses failing, food riots. It's the worst depression to this day in American history. Both parties are responsible, though. That whole surplus distribution thing, that was the Whigs' idea. The specie circular, that was the Democrats' idea. They both had problems with that. They were both involved. Um, but... The panic led the Democrats to pay the price of no government intervention. They basically were trying to do nothing, and then, okay, they weren't doing anything, and then all of a sudden, Van Buren's like, well, why don't I create this sub-treasury, which was pretty much the exact same thing as the Bank of the United States. And it just basically said, I'm doing this now, and no private company is allowed to fund based on speculation. The election of 1840 has come around, and now we're seeing the Whigs choose William Henry Harrison versus Martin Van Buren, and they run him on the campaign that he's just a simple guy from a log cabin, a cider man, while they made Van Buren look like the aloof aristocrat. Now, it's kind of a flip-flop of how it used to be, because the Democrats were like, we're the party of the common man, and the Whigs are the elitists. Well, now the Whigs realize that's how they're going to get votes, so they switch things around. Um, because of this, Harrison was able to win the election because of making themselves look more like the common man. And, of course, the Panic of 1837 killed Van Buren's image. So William Henry Harrison becomes president, makes this huge, long speech out in the cold when everybody said, don't do it. And he's like, I'm tough. I can do it. And then he dies of pneumonia from it one month later. So he is our shortest serving president. Who takes over his vice president, John Tyler, Tyler the guy who used to be a Democrat, who's now a Whig, but still acts like a Democrat. He doesn't do anything that the Whigs want him to do. He... He supports abolishing the sub-treasury, the independent treasury system of the sub-treasury. He wants to raise the tariff. He refuses to recharter the Bank of the United States like um, Henry Clay wants him to. And any type of internal improvements supported by the Whigs, he refused to support. So the Whigs basically said, you are no longer allowed to be in our party. They didn't kick him out of office. They just kicked him out of the party. His entire cabinet resigned, and Tyler and some conservative Whigs who supported slavery and states' rights prepared to join the Democratic Party. The Whigs barely held the White House. The only time that they actually got it into the White House was with John Tyler from 1880 to 1844 when they lost the election. Um, but they did have to deal with some diplomatic situations, like with Canada. Canada and Maine were fighting over the border between Maine and Canada, and they had a little war over it, the Aroostook War in 1838, because they were burning each other's ships. Well, 
they we were afraid we were going to have to go to a full-out war again with the British because the British control Canada. But um, our Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, and their British Lord, um, Ashburton, were able to make the Webster-Ashburton Treaty that basically like eased tensions that said, okay, here's the border between Maine and Canada, no more attacking each other. The Tyler administration did do something positive. They made the first diplomatic relations we ever had with China. And we were able to have some Britishes that the British already had with China of the extraterritoriality and port use. Basically, like we could like set up ports there and work with them and trade. Um, but like I said, the Whigs didn't really last long. The only term of office was when Harrison was in for a month and then he died. And then Tyler took over the rest of the time. They lost since 1844 to James Polk, who we'll be learning about next chapter. All right, I'm done.